Black holes are probably the most notorious entities in physics. This is for a good reason, as they are truly bizarre and mind-blowing. They are also extremely complex and abstract. It's pretty difficult to wrap your head around all the weird phenomena black holes manifest, or even what they are. Let's rethink black holes. This is going to sound weird, but I think it's actually easier to understand black holes if we think about them mathematically. Now I know, I know, this may seem unconventional, but let's see. Wherever you are in space-time, even weightless in space, invisible hands are constantly pushing you in a direction in a manner identical to force. These hands are actually curvatures in space-time. On Earth, we have invisible hands constantly pushing us down with a force of 9.8 newtons per kilogram. The strength of these hands, or this gravitational attraction, is not constant. The further away from a gravitational source, the weaker that attraction, or the less curved space-time is. As you throw a ball up into the air, the kinetic energy is lost as these hands work against it. Eventually, the kinetic energy is drained and the hands pull it back down. However, if you throw the ball really hard, gravitational attraction cannot outpower the kinetic energy fast enough. Thus, our ball keeps flying forever. This is the concept of escape velocity. As long as an object is moving at or faster than the escape velocity, the source of gravity can't capture it. Now the math. The first law of thermodynamics tells us energy is conserved. So along our ball's journey, it neither gains nor loses energy. Because E is constant or balanced, we can tell at any given moment where our ball's final trajectory will be. So let's do that. We freeze time and look at our ball's energy. It has positive kinetic energy and negative gravitational potential. This formula may look different than the formula you're used to. They both represent a similar idea, but the MGH formula is used for physics across short distances. For interplanetary calculations, we need to use this formula. And because of its applications, instead of growing with distance like MGH, its value shrinks. Because E is constant, if we solve for E at any given point in our path, we will get the same answer and the same realization. When E has a positive value, our ball is traveling above the escape velocity and will fly off into the cosmos. And if it has a negative value, it eventually falls back to Earth or orbit. If we set E to zero, then these two forces cancel out and our ball will never fall back to Earth. If we solve for velocity, we can then find out how fast our ball must be moving in order to escape Earth's gravity. Because the mass of our object is in both components, it cancels out, so this speed is equivalent for all objects of all sizes and masses. But what if gravity was stronger? What if you had to go really fast? Like, too fast? Let's say, the speed of light. Well, we can plug in C for V, and suddenly we have an equation that describes a gravitational field not even light can escape from. If we then solve for R, we have the distance from the gravitational source at which light cannot escape. This is the Schwarzschild radius, or event horizon, and now we've identified our black hole mathematically. A black hole is not a physical thing. It's a region in space-time where your distance from a gravitational source is smaller than this R. Really, black holes are just regions of broken space-time, where the rules and axioms of the universe break and no longer function. I like to imagine the universe as a simulation, and black holes as a bug where the developers weren't expecting someone to put that much matter in that small of a space, and the code or equations simply break. Let's explore further. Black holes aren't just strong gravitational forces. They are complete warpings of reality, time, and space. But since general relativity predicts that physics should behave normally in all reference frames, how would we even know things are being weird around a black hole? Let's imagine we are falling into a black hole. We're going to ignore tidal forces for this thought experiment. How would we know things were getting weird? One of the first videos on my channel was about gravity being a curvature in space-time and what exactly that means. We know surfaces are curved when two parallel moving entities cross each other's paths. We know space-time must be curved because when I let go of this ball, it's traveling in a parallel path to Earth, yet they intersect. 
As we fall into a black hole, we have no way of seeing this as my dropped ball just hovers next to me. Or do we? If we drop two balls on Earth, they fall straight down side by side. Or do they? If for some reason they were made out of a material that did not interact with matter, we would watch as they fell through the earth and slowly, over time, start to move closer to one another. The same thing happens as we fall into the black hole. If we were to drop two balls, we would see over time they would move towards each other, as if it were their own gravities pulling them together. The faster they move, the more warped space-time is around us. Another way we could observe our warped space-time is through the breakdown of Euclidean geometry. Let's say instead of falling into, we wanted to orbit around the black hole. When normally orbiting a gravitational body, we expect our circumference to be proportional to our radius from that gravitation. If we are orbiting a million kilometers from the center of the Earth, we can be pretty certain our circumference is 2 pi times that distance. If we were to orbit a black hole, we notice something strange between our radius from the black hole and the circumference of our orbit. As we get closer, the radius would continue to shrink, yet the rate of which our orbital circumference shrinks slows down. Soon we have illogical geometry where our circumference is greater than 2 pi the radius to the singularity. This is impossible to illustrate in three dimensions, so we need to move down a dimension. If we look at this embedding diagram of a black hole, we see that, as we move towards the black hole, the distance, or radius, shrinks, yet eventually, well, the circumference kinda doesn't. This means eventually you can't orbit a black hole. Orbits occur when your centrifugal force counteracts the invisible hands pulling you down. The closer you get to a gravitational source, the stronger its gravity, which means you need to counteract this attraction with more extreme centrifugal force. Traditionally, this is accomplished with a smaller orbital circumference and faster orbital speed. Normally, this is fairly easy to accomplish. Closer orbits have less energy, so you can just slow down a higher orbit and fall into the lower orbit. Black holes are different. The geometry of space-time here just simply doesn't allow it, and eventually you actually have to put energy into the orbit to go lower. This space-time warpage creates a limit called the Innermost Stable Circular Orbit, or ISCO. This is the closest you can stably orbit a black hole and is located three Schwarzschild radii from the singularity. Orbiting below the ISCO is possible, but due to the warping of space-time and the need for more energy, these orbits are very unstable. Let's look at a graph to understand this. Normal circular orbital energy states follow this line. This is a self-correcting or stable system. If you are orbiting below the line, you don't have enough energy to orbit at that radius and thus you fall towards the source of gravity. Eventually you cross a point where you can orbit again. If you orbit above this line, you have excess energy and move away from the gravitational source. Just like before, if you aren't moving above the escape velocity, you will find a new stable orbital radius. If we look at the energy states of orbits within the ISCO, we can see why it's unstable. If you move below the line, you will fall towards and into the black hole. If you move above the line, you move away from the black hole. Any tiny perturbation or gravitational anomaly in your orbit here will break it. If we did indeed want to orbit here, we would need to keep accelerating faster and faster as we moved closer. This would also require us to spin our ship at ludicrous angular velocities to keep our engines pointed tangent to do so. But ignoring this fact, eventually we would be going so fast orbiting this black hole that it would take more energy than existed in our fuel tanks to speed up further. If energy wasn't a constraint, we could orbit just above 1.5 Schwarzschild radii from the singularity, traveling at almost the speed of light. For something moving at the speed of light, like a photon, it can orbit at this distance. But this orbit is also unstable and any perturbation will cause the photon to spiral into the black hole or out into the cosmos. You can imagine that if light can only orbit 1.5 radii away, then it would take a tremendous amount of energy and force for a spaceship to get close to and then move away from the event horizon. But what if we could? What's at the event horizon? What happens if we can get that close? We'll explore that idea in the next video, as well as how black holes warp time, and the interesting thought experiments of such phenomena. Hope to see you then.